Let's talk about mechanical properties. Mechanical properties are those which are revealed in response to an applied force. So many of the tests we do this way because we want to simulate what the object or material is going to experience in the real world. We're trying to duplicate that in the lab as best we can. One of the main things we're looking for in a material is its strength. The strength is the ability of an object to support a load or a force. One of the other things we're looking for is the amount of deformation that occurs in the metal. So the amount it stretches or compress or flexes. And we want to know the ductility or malleability. So how much it stretches or how much it can be compressed without failure. So material testing usually applies a force and then measures the deformation that occurs. There's a couple common ways of loading a material. So there's tension, where we're gonna pull the material apart. Compression, where we push it together. Shear, where we have two forces on the same horizontal plane separated, and we're gonna press this way. So if you think about a shear pin, that's what they're designed to do. Flexure is typically gonna be three points. We're gonna hold a material with two points and then apply force with the other point. So I got a little piece of material here. We would hold it here and then press up, okay? And then torsion, where we would take a material, where we would take a material and twist it. So in the real world, you think about something like a skyscraper, right? You've got all those beams and girders. You've got all the compressive force because the building's heavy, right? You've got the side-to-side -side force from, from wind and torsion from the material twisting a little bit, right? All those materials are under a whole bunch of different kinds of forces all at the same time. But we can't quite do that in a lab. So we're gonna test them one at a time and see how the materials react. The organization that we go to to find out how to test things is the ASTM International. They have thousands of procedures for anything you could possibly think of. They've got tension tests, compression tests, flexure, torsion, shear, for all different kinds of materials. So we wouldn't test uh, plastic or fabric or fiberglass the same way we would test metals. There's a different procedure for each. Now we have to all follow the same procedures to get the same results, right? To be able to trust the numbers that we're getting. Now the results can be extrapolated. So if we're testing an airplane wing, we're not going to put the whole wing in a tensile test and pull on it, right? We're gonna just test a small piece of the material and from that information, we can figure out if it's good enough for the, the whole uh, structure. One of the most useful tests is tensile test. In the tensile test, we've got a standardized specimen. There's a, a bunch of different kinds, but they're typically round or rectangular. Now, what we really care about with the specimen is that they're uniform, right, in material and in shape, and the area where it's going to stretch and eventually break. The way the tensile tester machine works, it's got a big claw down here and a big claw up here. It's got an electric motor or hydraulics, whatever, it doesn't really matter. It's gonna pull the material apart, okay? It's really only measuring two things. It's measuring the force, so it's got a load cell usually in the top that's measuring how much force, so it's like a reverse bathroom scale right, or one of those luggage scales that you, know, you put weight on and it tells you how heavy it is. In this case, we're worried about how much force is being applied. The other is the extension. So if we start these two claws at zero, we want to measure how far the claw is pulling the material up. Now, I can't pull this with my own arms, but if I was a big, powerful machine, this thing would move. Even for really brittle materials, it'll move a little bit before it breaks. Really ductile materials like aluminum or iron or low carbon steel are gonna stretch a good bit 
before they break. Like this sample, if it's low carbon steel, it might stretch a, a quarter inch or three eighths of an inch before it breaks. So the machine is gonna measure that, typically with something called an extensometer, which is a device with little blades that fit right in the area you're measuring and very accurately measure how far it's moving apart. So with those two pieces of information, with those two pieces of information, we can draw a graph. So on this graph, I've plotted the load in pounds. This is what the load cell of the machine is measuring against the extension in inches. So how far the sample has stretched. So it's, there's gonna be a line. So if we start right here, so we start stretching, let's say we've stretched a little bit, mark right here, we'll have that much load applied. As we apply more load, it's going to be stretched more. And we keep going up and up and up. Now the slope of this line does matter, and we'll talk about it in a minute. The important thing to remember is the load and the extension only apply to one material at a time and one sample at a time. They won't apply, say if you test a quarter inch sample, those numbers won't apply to a half inch sample. To do that, we need some other terms to help us out. So those other terms are gonna be stress, which is the force over an area. So this will apply, we can take it from a quarter inch sample to a half inch sample to a three eighth sample. It's gonna be essentially universal. It's how much the stress in the material is how much force per area in inches squared, okay? The strain is gonna be the extension but applied across the board. It's the change in length over the original length. So it's gonna apply to any size specimen we need to. So when you look at a textbook, you're gonna get these numbers, not load and extension. The modulus elasticity is the slope of that line. It's gonna be stress over strain. The modulus of elasticity is a measurement of the stiffness of the material, and I'll show you why in just a second. So let's take a look at a graph with stress and strain. So strain is on our horizontal axis. It's measured in inches over inches, and then sometimes it's referred to as unitless, because inches over inches doesn't, doesn't really make any sense, right? It's just as easy to say nothing. Stress is measured in pounds over inches squared. Now it's the same deal. As we apply more force per unit area, we get more change in length over original length. So these are the numbers that the machine is gonna read out. Now this line right here matters. Or if you remember the modulus elasticity and stress over strain, it's just gonna be the rise over the run. So the steeper this line is, say over here, it's gonna be a higher, a larger modulus of elasticity. That's a more stiff material. So what it means, you're applying a lot of force. You're almost vertical here, but it's moving very, very little. It's extending very little. Whereas a flimsy material, right, you apply just a little bit of force and it's already stretching like crazy. So if you tested a rubber band, it would look something like this. You apply like no force and it just starts stretching right off the bat. Whereas if you test cast iron, it's gonna go almost straight up. It's got a high modulus of elasticity. So let's talk about what happens when the material breaks, right? We wouldn't wanna do one of these tests and then nothing happens, right? We pull the material until it breaks. So before it breaks, we're gonna have two regions that we care about. The first is called the elastic region. And the elastic region, when we pull the material, it can stretch, all right, we can see that right here, but when we release it, it's gonna go back to normal, right? That's the elastic region. There's a point at which that's not true. When the material hits called the yield point, it gives up, it won't accept any more force in this linear fashion, 
okay? This is called also sometimes a proportional limit. If you notice this line is straight, it's linear. You apply stress, you get a certain amount of strain. After the yield, you don't even have to apply more stress and it's already stretching more. The material has yielded. At that point, you cross over into the plastic region. In this region, if you take the, the sample out of the machine, it's not gonna bounce back to normal. It's gonna be permanently deformed. Now, designers don't want this to happen to their products, right? If you think a, a skyscraper, if half the beams have hit their yield point and they're in plastic deformation, it's only a matter of time before they creep back over and break. So designers typically want their materials to be about right here, right? They'll this much stress, this much strain, and then back to normal. At some point in the plastic region, if the same stress is applied and it keeps getting applied, it's gonna keep stretching, stretching, stretching until it fractures.